there are differences between poker and business, but there are also a lot of overlaps. Holds the keys to unlocking your poker game's potential. That made me feel warm and fuzzy. Holds the keys to unlocking your life potential. A little fuzzy and some spice. It's a rare combo. What's up, guys? Today we've got a very extra special guest, uh, nicknamed Dr. GTO, Dylan Wiseman who uh, not only holds the keys to unlocking your poker game's potential, but also holds the keys to unlocking your life potential and business potential as well, potentially. He also doubles as an executive coach, a rare combo to coach executives in how to make business decisions. Very different, as I've learned. I'm like a little bit overwhelmed trying to figure it out. And in poker, they're very different things. Uh, Dylan, what do you have to say for yourself, Mr. Dr. GTO? First off, that made me feel all warm and fuzzy. Thank you for the intro. All right, um, good. That's the aim, <laughs> to create some fuzzy feelings. A little fuzzy and some spice, right? Like we want to find that right. nice balance between fuzziness and spiciness. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm stoked to have you here. I've really enjoyed your podcast generally. And this is, it's a unique environment for me to have, to be on a podcast with someone who's also a client, right? And so this, oh. I think, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation for sure. Uh, all right. Well, it's a unique opportunity for me because- you know, as I've been doing the last few podcasts that haven't come out yet, I, it slowly clicked in my mind that exactly what I was looking for was like right in front of me on the podcast. Uh, so I had like Tommy Angelo and he's talking about applying Buddhism to poker and I haven't really learned Buddhism. So I'm thinking, oh, wait, maybe I should try this. And then I'm just thinking maybe everyone should just watch me try to figure out how to solve this game of life thing and salt and figure it out together. We're all figuring it out. And we can uh, we can figure out we can find out a bit about what you're doing and give me some lessons because as it turns out, this whole podcast is actually a bit of a lesson, but we'll get to that in a second because it's your turn to talk. Um, so I know your um, I know your poker coach and an executive coach. Uh, how exactly did you get to do either? Actually, how did you get to that point? I mean, first, obviously, you have to be a winning poker player and then have to have some business experience. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Uh, I started teaching in sixth grade. So I was like a math tutor in the sixth grade and I've been pretty much a teacher my entire life. It's one of my soul's favorite thing to do. And the two things over the past decade that I've probably put the most work into is my poker game, as well as my general understanding of not just like the business landscape and how to build companies, but how to effectively run a company as an oh, individual yeah. and as an entrepreneur. And yeah. you, were, you were mentioning how, from your perspective, there are divergent skill sets. And for me, I'd say that that's a yes and where there are differences between poker and business, but there are also a lot of overlaps. And yeah. so- what I've really tried to do is take my, not actually, I actually did it the reverse of what you would think. I took my understanding from business where I mostly focused in product development as well as machine learning and applied that to my poker game. Uh, that's where the Dr. GTO thing comes from because I got heavily deep into the solver streets and built out some systems for that as well as some products in that area. And then as I've started to really reintegrate into the poker streets, I'm now taking some of those lessons especially the lessons of being able to execute at a really high level, right? If you're playing the 50Ks and the high stakes games of the world, you have to have a very specific very specific skill set to be able to actually be effective at those levels. So taking yeah. those learnings and applying them back to the business world. So it definitely is a little mm -hmm. bit of a give and a take from both perspectives. Well, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I had multiple questions at once, actually, in pop of my head. But first, I want to ask, point out to you a funny little thing that happens in reality. So there's something that psychologists have never been able to figure out. But apparently, people uh, that are drawn to jobs that uh, fit their names. So, you like... Um, the, the author of that book's also name, uh, name was Wiseman, by the way. So it's funny that you're like a coach and you're teaching people and your last name is Wiseman to me. Another example would be like Sandra Lust would be like a, a, a sex relationships coach or something like that. <laughs> I, love, I love how you didn't pick Chris Moneymaker, which is like the biggest layup of all time in the poker world. You went immediately to Sandra Lust, who is a badass in her own right, for sure. So like, I, I like that a lot. Oh, did I did I pick like a real name? I think Sandra Lust is a real name. No way. Like, that sounds. I just so made good. that I'm, up. I'm gonna look. 
<laughs> I'm, gonna look that up. I'm gonna look that up. I hope it is. Yeah, but Chris Moneymaker, I guess, would be one. I'm sure there's some other ones or whatever. Um, but yeah, why don't you? Never mind, wrong person. But <laughs> same, same, but different. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, so, so uh, let's let's talk about a, a few different kinds of coaching here. Um, firstly, business coaching. Um, what was it that from business that you could take and apply to poker? Because uh, I could see some things that are really different. And yeah. I mean, as I've got into this, I realized, whoa, I'm like not ready to run a business. Or, I mean, I actually didn't wasn't running a business, but I was doing things that were very similar to running businesses on small scales. And now I see more and more of the same themes coming up. But why don't you go ahead and talk and tell me about some of the differences and some of the similarities? Totally. So I think the there's a couple aspects. And I'm actually going to pick two specific aspects to talk through. There is the process of actually building a company and then the process of actually executing a company. And both of those things I think show up in the poker world. So hmm. let's start, let's talk first about the aspect of building a company. That would be very similar to building your poker game. Like mm -hmm. not, not what you're doing when you're actually executing hand by hand, but how you actually prepare so that you are effectively ready to show up to the tables. And from my perspective, that turned into hiring a full-time analyst, um, hiring an executive assistant, hiring a marketing uh, professional so that I had systems that were built out all running in the background so that if, when I am actually in game, let's say I'm in the middle of a tournament, like I'm in the middle of the 50K, hand is over, I need a hand run, my analyst can run the hand after the hand. Also, my marketing person is taking care of all of my social media posts during that time period. So I am building an effective system that runs automatically in the background that has not only prepared me for when I'm sitting at the table, but it's also given me the tools that I need to be able to execute effectively. Uh, another thing that I mentioned there is like, I have a breathwork and meditation coach, right? So lots of preparation work that go that is, uh, that is a system that I've built that has nothing to do with me actually sitting at the table, right? And then we actually have the second by second execution, right? How you are able to show up as a high level and effective executor in a, in a hand, especially in a high stakes environment. And that's a lot of being able to handle pressure. It's a lot of being able to do logical thinking. It's a lot of being able to tap into the work that you did ahead of time, right? So all of that system building that you did, you need to be able to tap into it in game, in terms of the mental game stuff, in terms of the strategy that you've built. And so that's, from my perspective, what the, a lot of the best poker players do. Uh, take, take, the, take the Steven Chip books of the world. He has an incredibly effective system for studying poker, preparing for poker, and executing on it in game. And he's really? been able to, yeah, it's very obvious to me. I mean, you've played against Stevie. Literally in every single hand, he's doing the exact same thing, right? Shuffles sure. the chips the same amount of times, breathes no the same amount of times. No it's, fucking way. Man. I, 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 I mean, it, I, I've been at a final table That's with him, scary. and he no, it, it's like it literally is perfectly practiced, and it's in time with his breath. It it's so no so dialed way. in. Dude, next time you go to a table with Stevie, look at it, and obviously there's a little bit of variance. <laughs> but for example, like if I'm at a final table specifically, sometimes it reads like, twice before acting instead of three or four times. Is dude, that the variance? <laughs> a little bit it's 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 real for sure and he he checks the exact same way he shuffle chips the exact same way it's a very well designed system for execution and all and his poker game in and of itself is, is also savage right like finds aggression in all the right places you can tell that he's very game theory oriented finds some deviations where he needs to Shit, say you, so huh? the difference it was funny watching you and yuri at the 50k final table because you two are like the polar opposites in terms of this right yuri was very similar to stevie very calm controlled very systemic thinker you're just fucking yolo wing as macho man <laughs> over here but it but it but it's it's a very in flow process for you like you, you you're a very flow state poker player right you're like you you've done a lot of prep work away from the tables but when you're there you're super dialed into what's going on it just shows up in a different way and I also think that this ties into why you've had a little bit of trouble transitioning from the high stakes poker world into the business world. It's because your poker game wasn't super systemic, right? You're, you don't you're have right. this like perfectly dialed in process. You just are a, you're not a field player, but you're met much more on the flow and intuitive side versus the dude like Stevie. Sure. Well, the thing that I, I mean, I basically did things in a bit of an unusual way, I guess. There's a certain element to me that is extremely logical uh, and course. that if I can see something in a system doesn't add up, I can I can feel it. And 
that lot of logical infrastructure has to be maintained. And in that way, I'm extremely logical, but, uh, Man, there's no like it would take so much practice for me to do what you just said, Stevie does. This is like the that, crazy. That's not your thing. job. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> you don't need to, that. That's one of the most beautiful things, though. You don't have to, right? You get to one. One of my favorite things about poker and business as well is that there are so many roads to success, right? And so when I'm coaching someone, both in poker or in business, my job is not to put them into a cookie cutter. My job is to understand what their natural strengths are understand where their natural weaknesses are, build a system that will allow them to plug some of the leaks that are just infrastructural. Like for example, for you, getting you an exec assistant, that was just necessary, right? Like yeah, that's a yeah, very, yeah. very easy <laughs> link to plug, but I'm not trying to like overhaul your entire life to force you to be living by a calendar 24 seven. Cause that's not, no, no. that's not attuned to who you are. It's not going to work. That would be the fucking insane. Yeah. It would just yeah. not be practical. Exactly. Correct. And that's from my perspective, what being a really good coach is it's understanding who you're working with, understanding the entire complex hmm. they have for the problems that they're trying to solve for and then building something for them that is that will feel intuitive to use obviously there will still be some growing pains because you have to get used to new systems but it shouldn't feel so hard that it's breaking every three days right there should be oh, a little yeah, bit of a yeah. learning curve it can't, and then it, yeah it has to be a study it. uphill thing you can't like push yourself super hard i learned this the hard way also yeah. Um, you have to be, it has to be steady and, and concise and it's hard to like balance this like structure and like pushing yourself. You have to like listen to both your intuition and, and logic, uh, use some logic to some extent. Yeah. That's, but that's also, I think one of your bigger superpowers as well is the, is the intuitive side. And that's something that is really hard to build for a lot of people because they, they are, such logical thinkers that being able to take a step back and being able to tune into your intuition that in and of itself is a superpower right and so if i'm yeah. if i'm removing Thank that you. from your yeah, yeah of course dude and if so if i'm removing that from your day-to-day -day, if i'm not allowing you to tap into your intuition and i'm forcing you to do something else we've lost one of your greatest skills and that's that's not how you're going to become successful you're going to become successful because your days feel good right like that's actually something that i was thinking about it's like what does it mean to be, win the game of life right well yeah and, yeah that's what i've been thinking about too is that for better or worse is that i mean for everyone everyone can agree that i presume they can agree i know actually i take that back I presume ultimately what everyone really wants to do is feel really good. Just a lot of people are blindsided by the fact that they think mo more money or more insert, like whatever thing, more uh, girls or more um, fucking poker skills or more tournament wins will make them happy. Uh, and I mean, yeah, uh, but ultimately they find that that's not really true. Com completely agree. The, I try to be a little more specific when it comes okay. to when it comes to defining what success looks like because sure. that's really what we're trying to do. It's like yes. what will, what would it look like to win? Like what does success mean in terms of winning the game of life? And sure. from my perspective, it means so that each and every day feels healthy as much as it can be and feels like uh, feels stable and good as much as it can be. Right? Because if your days feel healthy and your days feel good, like you enjoy living your days at a really high frequency, you're going to be able to execute on so many things in life, right? You're going to be able to hit all, pretty much every goal that you set out for yourself. Sure. And so to, to me, that's what the, that's where success comes from is finding that stability in, in your days. Sure. Um, I want to add a little bit of a nuance there because mm -hmm. I think what you're describing is the true path in the path in the sense of this is the path to feeling the best and ultimately yielding the, uh, best possible return, which is what I'm interested in, by the way. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out that not everyone will agree in the sense, like you can see, at least from their actions, they might agree on paper. There's a lot of people that agree on paper for all sorts of things and don't follow through with their actions and they prioritize money and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I agree. And for any goal, you have to kind of like align that in the direction of the goal is what I think. Completely agree. I try to approach people deviating from what we consider optimal with a little bit more empathy, because from my perspective, we, you and I have defined what success looks like. And 
what we feel is the optimal way to go about it. But that's because we have a very set of, we have a very specific set of circumstances and life experiences that have given us this intu like intuition, insight, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. And the majority of humans just don't have that. It's a, it's a lack of experience. It's a lack of resources. It's a lack of time to be able to actually dictate to these things. And so when they're not, let's say they're not being GTO, right? They're, they're, let's say that their actions aren't actually aligned with what it means to find happiness and success. A lot of the times it's not because they don't want to do it. It's because they don't have the tools or the time or the resources to be able to effectively navigate it. And so what I think our, yeah, go, I was going to, one more thing. I, and so I think our jobs are to not just say, okay, this is what the correct answer is, but to think a step further, which I know is something you're thinking about, and say, okay, given where people are deviating and given the inefficiencies that show up in this world, where can we plug those leaks for the general population so that it makes things easier, so that it makes their days feel a little bit more in flow, both in terms of like the learning as well as the growth and the resources that they need to find to live? Um, so I've got three points here uh, that are, seem unrelated. So the first one is... What you're really alluding to is actually like a bit of an explanation to why Buddha said that the, the solution to the world is compassion, presumably on an infinite scale. Um, as you can see, as we've alluded to, a lot of people just simply don't have the um, whatever the means are, the time or the, the realizations or the path or whatever it is to get to the same place. Um, so that happens to be well, empathy and compassion are quite interlinked i guess you could say they're close to each other yes um so that's one thing i want to point out uh another thing that i want to point out before i forget and uh, i want to point out that one of your strengths that i've noticed is that you're really to the point and able to describe these things in great detail which is very good for teaching and saving time uh a lot of people don't recognize that and they blabber on all and all on and stuff uh, one thing we share in common is typically i'm to the point but not i think you're better than me more clear for sure. Uh, and the third thing I want to point out is that through this podcast, that we're essentially putting multiple pieces together uh, in my eyes. That's the hope anyway. And through explaining things logically, I hope to reach an audience that is um, reachable through logic and through action, the poker audience, to see how some of the principles in poker, if you just take them to their conclusion, um, will will inspire them to do things outside of poker, uh, or at least people that are curious enough to inquire, if that makes sense. Totally. Um, first off, thank you. I appreciate those words. Um, conciseness in language is hard, and it's an active process to get better at it, uh, from yeah. my perspective. Yeah, yeah especially I, in person. Totally. Um, I want to take the first and the third point and combine them a little bit, because you're talking about how we can logically describe what's going on to people, right? Yes. And and that can help them in terms of creating new systems or finding new experiences that will allow them to move forward in life. I think that's important. And I also think that it's important to find that emotional and that compassionate side. So speaking with empathy to, to an audience that might not, like, for example, let's say that you're on one side of an argument, they're on another side of the argument, you're logically correct, but they're not hearing you because it's actually an emotional thing that they're feeling. And I'm sure you felt right. this all the time. Right? Yes, like this happens yes. literally all the time. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's kinda like, it's like uh, when someone's just fuming out of their mind and someone's telling them uh, yeah, yeah. whatever, why are you, why are you getting so angry? You're like, and you're just raging. And you're like, shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> so that um, I actually have a, Pro tip for everyone, this actually comes from Dr. Liz Powell, who is my relationship therapist. If you're ever so tilted that you can't listen to someone else, you need to take a time out because your brain is no longer processing logically. Your prefrontal cortex is no longer firing. And so you literally cannot think logically anymore from a like neurological perspective. So you need to communicate that you are too tilted and then say, I need to take a 20 minute time out until your brain can calm down. Um, that's a, okay. one of my, one of the biggest pro tips I have ever gotten ever. I use it with my partner. I use it with my friends. I use it with my parents. Like it is, it is the stone nuts. Um, but going back to what we were talking about, it's mm -hmm. the, it's the empathy, I think that is actually going to take probably you further because you're such a powerfully logical creature. And people associate, I think that with you is this powerful logic side. And so if you can learn the, the superpower of more broad empathy, 
on top mm -hmm. of this logical superpower that you have, you're going to be able to create so much more impactful change. And this is something you and I have talked about before, where you can, like, you have so much compassion for others. You you want to help them. You want you want to care about them. But it's sometimes hard for you to relate to what they're going through because sure. because it's the empathy component. And so I also I really feel that this podcast is a beautiful platform for you to learn that a little bit more of an empathetic side. I'm not saying that this is like for example having like a Justin Bonneville on here. I'm not saying that it would be the easiest conversation, but if you were able to empathize with what he is feeling even and you two are a little bit divergent in terms of the way that you approach the world, say it's like the same really? same but different. Yeah, same same like I'm I'm good friends with both of you. Y'all y'all have same same but different tendencies for sure. Okay. And so there is overlap and there's also divergence. And so that type of a conversation, I think, would be really powerful for general humans to see because it would force both of you to be able to show up with empathy to to then soften the logical blows that you're trying to pass back and forth. Sure. Actually, my relationship with Tom Dwan is going in that kind of funny yeah. odd direction. It's kind of like slowly yeah, I've, yeah, I've realized empathy in the sense of like, been in some situations that aren't as bad as him but yeah. uh are like similar kinds of feelings if that makes sense yeah. uh and empathize with some of his decisions it's like we like surprisingly had a number of things in common uh if that makes sense that's a that's a it's a tough one and it's a powerful one um one of one of the more one of the greatest healers is, is empathy and forgiveness right and you you got done dirty by tom dewan like it, there's, yeah there's, but he didn't like yeah. I mean, he didn't mean to. He actually put in quite an effort to yeah. to make it right. I agree. So what I'm saying is I agree. And the fact that you've been able to get to this point, right, that you've been able to, like, go past the, um, the, the facts. Like, the facts were this is what happened, right, X, Y, and Z. And if you were just to have stopped there, it would, have, it would have been so easy for you to stay salty and continue to hold this, like, really big... Um, like burden in your in your body and you're not doing that anymore because you actually have been able to have these conversations with him and find a point of empathy so now you can like now you don't have to sit around and be like wow fuck this guy he still owes me x amount of dollars but you can actually have a conversation and say no i actually kind of got what he was going through i don't agree with his choices i don't agree with how he did it but i i can understand it because i have some empathy for things that i've gone through as well yeah well the next question and the big question that everyone is watching and wondering <laughs> I'm starting to see a bit of a solution okay. is how can it be solved? That's so do you want to talk about that? Uh, we could see what well, your doctor GTO, maybe you've got some great insights here. Uh, here's a tough spot. Mr. Dr. GTO yeah. wise man. We'll yeah. see what you got. <laughs> I, I think I need, I need some more data first in order oh, okay. to, in order to effectively solve the problem. So right. well, um, maybe that, we'll keep that one for a later podcast, okay. I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think that's okay. my that, that's an entire that's an entire conversation that actually I think would be really it's a fun teaser, to a teaser for the watchers. Yeah. Agreed, Dr. Agreed. GTO and, and Dan find a solution. And we get Tom on air too, maybe. <laughs> I would I would 100 percent be in for that. I don't know if he'd be down to do it live, but that would be in and of itself a phenomenal conversation. You know, I there was something really surprising lately. I have a uh, pitched an idea to Tom and to others, but uh, one thing that was very admirable of him is he's supportive of the idea of a poker blacklist. I think a blacklist is a little bit too negative. I think it should be a black and white list or a zebra list. Is there what is that? <laughs> something like that? Uh, because you can't like just only look at the negative for multiple reasons. Um, and uh, he's actually supportive of that idea, which is pretty crazy. I mean, if he's supportive enough to like, you know, our, our debt's still unresolved to put his name wherever it's appropriated. Like, he didn't. I, I don't. I don't like. He, I, he wouldn't be all the way black, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, some people would be, but not him. Um, yeah. uh, I uh, I don't know him that well, but I think it's it's a little hard to take that with as much stoke from my perspective. And I'm not talking negative on Tom Dwan. More so, just like I don't think it would negatively impact him very much because people already know what happened with you, right? It's like very public knowledge. His reputation is already what it is within all of the poker circles, right? And sure. so and so it it doesn't actually it, it's not like that much of a gift, let's say, to put himself on that poker blacklist because it's not actually gonna actually impact him in any way. It might impact him a little bit worse than that, but we'll see anyway. Yeah. Just to just to I, I want to throw that idea out there for people to think about it because I think something like this should happen as a test. 
Um, but let's get back to that in a second. This, this topic's a little bit too esoteric. I want to talk a little bit more about your coaching because you mentioned, and then I think a lot of people will be interested in this and you applying your coaching uh, to all sorts of people. Let's talk about like how you apply to help different kinds of poker players because I wasn't yeah. even, on, I guess I should have known that some players are just super routine-like and this works. I, I must be the exception in a few ways. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, that's a phenomenal question. Um, so one thing that I do with literally everyone that I start coaching is we have a 30 minute conversation and we just talk through um, where they are in their poker journey, where they're trying to go in their poker journey and how they generally think and approach the game. Because there is so much that goes into becoming a successful poker player. And that definition of success, like we talked about earlier, is different depending on each person, right? And so some person's definition of success might be, hey, I have a job that I love. I would love to just be able to beat like quarter quarter in three years, right? Three years from now, playing quarter quarter on the weekends, this is what I want to optimize towards. And so that's their goal now. And so, and they have X amount of time to dedicate per week, per month, per year. So my job is to take all of this empirical information, what they're trying to move towards, and then build out a game plan for them in order for them to, in order for them to find success. That type of a person is going to have a very different game plan than somebody who is 24 years old, is already beating PLO 100 online, and really wants to be able to grind up to like the 1Ks, the 2Ks, the 5Ks. Um, it's going to look very, very different, both in times of how much, both in terms of how much time I would tell them to dedicate to learning tools such as Monker Solver versus just studying heuristics from a tool like Monker Solver, right? Then mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to vary depending on how on on how they're how they need to approach the game in order to hit their definition of success um and it also is it also depends on just what their best learning mechanisms are there are some players for example chris wayner uh, the one of my friends who i made my advanced PLO mastery course with homie just grinded the sims he's like a sauce one two three he just grinded the sims for like half a decade did mm -hmm. it every single day for half a decade and just like is now one of the best game theory oriented PLO players on the planet like okay. I take him in almost every lineup, but he he has the ability to build a system and execute on it over over the long term, right? He can do the same system every week, every month over a multiple year period. That's not feasible for a lot of humans. That's just not how a lot of humans work. Myself included. Yeah. I, I'm a neurodivergent ADHD. Like no, I'm an ADHD human. And so I, I wasn't able to do that. So when I was trying to grind up to the highest stakes in poker, that's not what I did. I did sit in the lab for six months and just run a bunch of sims so that I could learn game theory effectively. But at this point, that's not what my system looks like. I learn better when I'm looking at a document, reading it, and then talking to someone about it. That is my most effective learning mechanism. And so that's what I will do with some of my students. Instead of having them run their own sims, I will like will give them like a, a couple documents to read or one of my courses. And then we just have a conversation about it because that's the best way that they will learn. And then I'll be like, okay, take these things that you've learned, go play, and then write down how you're thinking about each of these individual scenarios that you find yourself in, because that's how they best learn versus somebody who just runs a bunch of Sims. I have them go play 10,000 hands online. I'm like, yo, let's look at your database and find any leaks that like, okay, you're probably not finding enough check raises on the turn because your red line's a little down here in terms of this overall note of the game tree. Let's now go back to specific board textures in this note of the game tree, talk through where your lack of understanding is and how you can find a little bit more aggression there, right? And, okay. so, and so it needs to be pinpointed depending on who the student is. For example, the, the system that I've built you from a from like an executive perspective looks very very different than other systems that I built from executives that come from a, a business background right like they they didn't need as much of the help with getting a schedule and being able oh, to yeah. show up on time <laughs> to things, right? that, that was oh, like I'm so bad at that I don't know what the fuck's wrong with me <laughs> it's like it, it, my um I'm gonna quote Dr. Liz again. And I literally had a session with them yesterday, and their perspective was if you tried to take my ADHD brain and have it live like a normal human, I'd crash and burn. And that's the same thing with you. We don't your brain should not be put into this mold of like a perfect schedule. You do have to learn how to show up on time to things, which is which is a skill set which you've gotten better at, right? I have, but, wait, I have gotten better slowly at that. It took yeah. a this one was one of those weird things I was just bad at for like no reason. <laughs> it's because you never practiced. It's a it's a practice just like anything else. Um, so, yeah. and so going back to what I was saying, you're 
your job is not to like pigeonhole the person. A lot of people in the business space, they're not as good as at having like creative ideas for scaling things. They're not as good at problem solving, right? And so those are the skills that I'm teaching them, right? Um, how, like, how do you actually show up to a, how do you show up to a meeting with investors and be able to not be nervous? Right. If you were to show up to a meeting with investors, you'd be like, all right, what up? I'm here. I'm Dan. Like, this is, the, this is what I got. Do you want to give me money? Whereas a lot of, because you're, you're so good at performing under pressure, right? Like this is something that is just intuitive to you. A lot of humans don't have that same skill set, right? So that's where they need the additional help and resources, right? And that same thing with poker, same thing in business. You got to just find out where the strengths are and where the areas for growth are and just find either if it's myself plugging those leaks or if it's somebody else who, like, for example, a Brandy, who is a better, um, well, Brandy is Dan's exact assistant, who is a better um, better fit for helping to plug those specific leaks. Okay. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. I imagine, uh, I imagine that to it, uh, if you find the right approach, you could teach a lot of poker players. I'm a bit curious how you would teach the ones who are more intuitive or do you even... A couple, uh, this, I'm asking this question plus, uh, part of it, um, which is, uh, how you would teach people who, um, yeah, are more intuitive and not so logic driven. I don't know if it's possible. Uh, and on top of that, how to teach people who are beginners and don't necessarily have a propensity towards, or, uh, playing poker well, let's put it that way. Yeah. The, that's that was actually that's the hardest thing that I've ever done from a poker teaching perspective is I built an introductory course nine like you know hundred dollar price point ten hours and then you say okay how do you actually teach someone who has literally zero background and probably doesn't even have a, a strong background in problem solving or in games right mm -hmm. and what I what I came to was less information so you don't overload people you give them yeah. the absolute basics you give them a couple heuristics. And then you allow them to just explore on their own. Because if you if you give someone a bunch of rules off the bat and they're already not, not very dialed into problem solving, they're just going to be thinking about 20 things at the same time, none of which makes sense to them. Right. Whereas if you give them the basic foundations of like, hey, this is like this is what a flop is. This is what it means to have a wet or a dry board texture. This is why those things are true. Okay. Here's a couple of examples. Here's a sizing that you use on these boards. This is how you think about it. And then now just go, right? Like you don't, you don't give them so much information that it's going to be overwhelming. You give them an amount of information that you believe is sufficient to then allow them to go learn on their own and then come back with questions. Because for the more intuitive people, it's easier to teach them if they're coming to you with the questions on their own versus hmm. you just trying to slam a system into their face. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. work as well. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't think that many people learn really if you slam a system into someone's face. It's just like... Some people oh. Really? Of, like, oh yeah. Like, I'll, I'll, some people specific, like a, a lot of my friends from college are academics, right? They got their PhDs in chemistry and physics and statistics, and they are just absolute savages at, at like having, having a system of knowledge put in front of them and like, okay, I'm just going to dissect the system of knowledge and then move forward. It's why, why aren't they playing poker or why aren't it? Yeah. Some of them, some of them did. I, I have, I have a couple, we had, we had the toughest two cent, five cent game probably in the world during college where it's like, <laughs> it's like, like a $5 buy-in and everyone was just like four betting each other. It was so fun. Um, like what? <laughs> I mean, I think a lot. So you, you ask a good question. It's like, why aren't they poker players? A lot of them are poker players, but they're not professionals. And it's because professional poker is in and of itself a very challenging vocation because you have to inherently deal with variance as a part of your day to day right? A lot of people don't want to have to deal with like losing a third of their bankroll over a six month period, playing in games that they're huge favorites in, right? And that, that shows up once every couple of years as a professional poker player. Like it showed up to me twice in the last three years where I just had four month long downswings and I have to just sit there and be able to handle it emotionally, right? Knowing that I am still beating these games, being able to move down in stakes, run a bunch of Sims, work with coaches on my own and effectively not burn out and go busto, right? Mm -hmm. That is a stupidly challenging skill set and I'll, and stress that a lot of people just don't want to pull onto themselves, right? We we have this upside of a lot of money and the freedom to be our own bosses and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, similar to the entrepreneurial lifestyle. That just isn't in line with some people's souls. They want to do work that they enjoy and have it be stable. 
and do the work, be done with the work, go do some other stuff in their life. And the poker, that's just not what you're going to get if that's how you're dedicating your time professionally. It's a lot of other upsides, though. It's like, course, in many yeah. ways, more stable than other jobs. Actually, Nassim Taleb pointed out something rather astute, is that the taxi driver has a much better job in theory, or as much, has a much more stable job in theory than an executive, because the taxi driver may complain or whatever, that some days they get different amounts and other days they get good amounts, or excuse me, um, big amounts. Yeah. And, uh, but like they're never going to be out of business. Uh, and an executive can just be fired. Now they have a serious problem for like no reason in their control. It's actually like a way worse situation if you think about it. And like poker's not going to like, it's not going to like disappear anytime soon. Uh, let's put it that way. I mean, it slowly, it's not even exactly going down. It's going in different directions. Like the tournaments have grown over time, I believe. Yeah. Maybe you know this. So we have two more minutes. I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. The, okay. I'm going to give it a yes and because you're correct that in a vacuum, um, poker players have a lot of benefits because they have this access to a game that's going to be around for a very long time. What you're discounting is that humans in general have a ton of emotional entanglement with money. With, 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 because it is a survival thing, right? Slash, from a cultural perspective, money is such a gnarly concept, and this is an entire podcast subject for sure, in and of itself. Uh, but to be able to deal with financial variance is just mm -hmm. not a muscle that a lot of people have trained. Uh, okay. and, and so you're right in that if they were to think about it purely logically over an infinite sample size, they, they do have a little bit more stability. That doesn't necessarily mean that their bodies are going to feel that. And it does, they don't sure. have to, they don't have to build that skill set either. They can build their life in a way where they don't have to do that. And so there's a little bit of a give and a take there. Sure. Okay. Um, well, is, do you want to, uh, continue? I mean, I, I do want to talk about the team hiring stuff, uh, mm -hmm. about how you hire team and man and look for inefficiencies in teams. This seems like an interesting subject and how that relates to poker. I've been learning this a bit myself lately. Poker is a very, very isolatory sport. You don't really have to work as a team. Um, well, you do a little bit. You have to work sometimes as a team if you're sharing action or you have a backer, for example. You need to learn how to deal with your backers a little bit different. Um, you have If you're like you and someone else are working on sims or whatever it is, you have to delegate work or try to like work as a partner, that kind of thing. But you never really have to like run a team for the most part, or like figure out who's good for the job or fire people. Uh, that's been an interesting learning curve for me. Certain things have come really different from others. Uh, but as I said, this running this podcast has actually become a lot like running a small business. And I'm actually thankful that in a way, this is like a foray into business because I want to do things in business at some point. Um, mm -hmm. And uh same with the charity foundation. It's been quite similar to that. I've had to learn certain things. Uh, so why don't you tell me about your uh, route towards learning how to do that? Because that doesn't seem like an easy job at all, actually, for multiple reasons. Totally. Um, so so there's the part of hiring a team and running a team. Right? Yeah. Those are, those are the two aspects that we're juggling right here. Let's start with the hiring part, and then we can get to the, we can get to the running of a team. So when you're trying to hire for anything, one of, the, one of the most important things and one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they're not concise enough, right? They, and this is something that you and I have talked a lot about as well, and where we've kind of found some inefficiencies in your thought process, where it's like, instead of saying, I need to hire someone for YouTube, right? Like that's, a, that's like the, the general idea. It's like, I just want to hire someone for YouTube to say, I need somebody who can edit videos, who can edit thumbnails, who understands YouTube's algorithm and can manage that entire system. So the first yes. thing that you, that you always need to do when, doing, when, when, when creating a hire is mapping out the work that they're actually going to be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Because if you don't do that, then the probability of mishiring somebody goes up exponentially. I've been mishired into jobs multiple times. And this is actually how I think I learned this lesson was being mishired for companies when I was back in the uh, back in the tech world, I my first two years I was hired correctly. I worked as an analyst and then transitioned into business intelligence analytics, which is pretty much just like problem solving for companies using data science, right? Like mm -hmm. using building different systems to help companies uh, learn about themselves, hit different goals, all that jazz. 
I then got headhunted and was hired to another company where I explicitly defined that this is the work that I did. I showed up on my first day and they wanted me to start coding databases, which is a data engineering task. And so that process really showed me, it's like, okay, on paper, it, I had the word data. I, I looked like I was smart. And so they figured I could just, you know, make it work or whatever. But in reality, that was an incredibly inefficient system because I didn't actually have the the technical skill set needed to execute on the problems they had for that business. And so the what this really comes back to is understanding what you're trying to solve for, which means you have to be very honest in terms of yourself, like what, what is needed. And you also have to have enough information to know what to hire for, right? And this is, I think, where a lot of the ambiguity comes in. It's like, you kind of know you, you need a YouTube person, but you don't actually know what they should be doing, right? So generally speaking, a lot of the times before you hire someone, you need to hire a consultant to be like, yo, dude, or do that, like what, what am I even should I be doing right now? And that's a lot of what I do with the exec dev coaching as well. It's like coming in and telling people the systems they need to build and, and what, what they're looking for, because that knowledge is actually really hard to obtain. You obtain it through having done the work and having executed on projects like that. And so that's, that's step one, even before you get to the human aspect of it, you need to really have everything buttoned up in terms of knowing. Wait, so how do you get that knowledge? Because it seems like you're, it seems like you're saying like, to get that knowledge, you got to do the thing, but you're trying to do the thing. You know what I mean? So you so usually you do the thing on your own first. You try to you try to figure it out. It's like okay, like that's so, how I I earned a lot of my knowledge is just I, I worked in the weeds at like the lower end of tech for three years. So I learned the gunks of the marketing analytics work, and I learned the like I was a Twitch streamer. I did Twitch analytics. I did manual YouTube ads. I also did product development from the ground up. So I learned these systems to, um, from actually doing the work. Uh, I want to ask a question if there's an alternative route is, and this is also a bit of a, um, also does apply to poker in a way is uh, get an, get an outside view, like consult people or find yeah, the right consultant. This is what I've been like kind of trying to do is consult a lot of people and then realize, Oh shit, these are things I need to do. Then jump in um, rather than try to do it myself because I'm going to fumble a lot in the dark. Uh, I don't know if that's an effective route in comparison to just fumbling in the dark. Do you know what I mean? Because you got you don't a, want to fumble too much in the dark. I it's think not it's, a yes, fun. it's a yes both. Um, I think doing a little bit of the work on your own is just really important so that you get the baselines. So you can even ask the right questions to a consultant. Um, the, the the issue with consultants as well in general, and this is something I know that you've dealt with, is that there are just a lot of charlatans. There are people that use a lot of words and speak as if they know the system that you're trying to build out. And then when it comes to actually doing the work, it they don't have it. And so, um, and so that's not to say that you shouldn't hire consultants. It just means that you have to, that's another skill that you need to level up. It's like actually learning how to find people who know what they're doing, who can even push you in the right direction. Well, that's super important. Yeah. That's one of the most important yeah. things is who's actually good at their job. Like that's the figuring out that is pretty, that's like pretty key. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? Um, at this point in my career, I tend to use a lot of referrals because I've built out a pretty robust network of people. Like I'm not good at everything. I'm not good at SEO. I'm not good at enterprise sales. There's a lot of work that I haven't done, but I have friends who have diversified. And, and so you like leveraging a network is really powerful. That's one of actually the main benefits of hiring an executive coach like me is that instead of having to go to like a random network on LinkedIn, you just get access to my network. And then I put you in contact with people that I've already vetted for you um, to do the sort of work. I want to call you out for a second in a way, yeah. but on the whole, you've done like quite a bit of work. Let's just say, I mean, yeah, that's a very reliable way of doing things, but isn't that still like, I mean, it's still like kind of taking the easy way out at a, at a certain point from my point of view, you still want to be able to figure out who's really good at their job and who's not. You still want to have I, that so, skill set. So step one is just to like get a person in front of you. Right. I'm not okay. saying that you that you automatically hire the person. I'm saying that you get someone in front of you who has a higher probability of being able to do the work. And then from there, you have to you have to build up enough intuition. This is like the CEO skill set, right? To be able to tell whether or not someone is bullshitting you or who or who actually can do the work. And this, unfortunately, there is no easy answer here because you have to just try and fail a bunch of times. I've had four failed I had four failed businesses before my first successful one literally I crashed and burned four times I had a business that had like it wasn't my money but I was like head of building a product that lost over a million dollars like I've I've yeah. built multiple companies that just failed and it sometimes takes really expensive lessons 
to really expensive experiences to learn valuable lessons, right? And so that that is a that is a wealth of knowledge that I've paid for with my time and with my resources that I can now take into these different contexts and conversations. Um, there are there are like there there are, there are podcasts like the Mixergy podcast, or the Tim Ferriss podcast, right? Other other resources where they kind of talk through the entrepreneurial mindset in a lot of spots, how to build and grow without learning these lessons the first time, so you don't have to pay for them. But no matter what, there's going to be there there's going to be a a toll that you have to pay. Yeah, in yeah, terms of, of your time and resources. Um, yeah, you just want to minimize the toll is what I'm getting at. Like you're going to fuck yeah. up at some, but you know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I'm going to pull us back to, because um, we kind of veered off, I'm going to pull us back to the actual hiring component, right? Oh, yeah. Because hiring all, and finding out and um, hiring, running, and potentially the inefficiencies. Yeah, totally. So so, what, so th this is the first aspect of the hiring, which is just understanding the problems that you need to solve, right? And then mm -hmm. we went into this next aspect of how do you start to source? So there's problem solving and then sourcing leads, like sourcing candidates, which in and of itself is not trivial. I'm actually going through that with my partner right now. She's making her first full-time hire for her marketing agency. And we she's gotten like over 200 applications. We're, I'm, I'm probably gonna do like 10-ish so second round interviews um, with, with candidates that we vetted because the first round of interviewing was a one-way um, one way interview where they we ask them five questions, they reply in video format, and then we get their questions. So that is sourcing, right? There's yep. the problem that you're trying to solve for, sourcing those candidates, and then actually being able to interview them effectively to see if they have the knowledge that you're looking for. Because a lot of the times, um, so and I'm not there's so much in hiring, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but let's there, there's a couple, there's I'd say two main boxes, which is cultural fit and technical fit, right? Mm -hmm. Is this a human? that not only will feel good for you to work with, but they will feel good working for you, right? In the same way that a relationship needs to be two ways, hiring is two ways. And then do, can they actually do what they say that, they're, that they can do? Or even on top of that, what they say they can do, what you need them to do, and maybe even a little bit extra, right? Because we all know that jobs become a little bit fuzzy, especially if you're hiring for a podcast or hiring for a small agency. And so, that's how I think about the actual hiring process. And then in terms of asking questions, that's, um, there's a lot that goes into it, but your, your job pretty much is to get them to show you themselves in a way where you're not like being overly violent in a way where you're not trying to like bang the information out of their brains. There's a couple of spots where you need to add a little bit of pressure. For example, if you have a job that requires acting under pressure, you, you have to test them whether or not that's the environment they can handle. But generally speaking, that's not going to be necessary. Um, and your job is to create a set of a, a set of conversation topics that will give you the intuition into the cultural fit and the technical fit. Okay. Then, All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cultural fit, I neglected, but maybe it hasn't just just hasn't been that much of an issue. Um, what about uh, running a team, and also about the actual process of mapping out inefficiency? Yeah. Oh yeah, the that's, it's honestly my favorite work to do. I really? love I love running teams of people. Yeah, it's it's because it it's a combination of problem solving with humans, which is the same thing as poker, right? Because you have a bunch of humans who have problems that they need to solve, and so you need to be able to effectively um, create a larger system that allows them to solve the problems that they're trying to solve as efficiently as they can. And then there's so there's a lot of logical problem solving in that with humans, which is so fun, and then. There's the emotional and coaching aspect of it, where it's like your job in being a good manager, not only is to get them to do their work, but to make them feel as if they're growing professionally, because that's yeah. what that, that is how you retain good people. You retain good people by paying them what they're worth and then making them feel as if they are worth what they are, which is different for each person, right? They're in the same way that different people have different love languages in a romantic relationship. People have different love languages in a work relationship. Your job as a manager is to learn what their love language is from a professional perspective and, mm -hmm. and then speak it. So whether it's mentorship, okay. whether it's more money, whether it's more time off, whether it's like working in a fancy office, like you just have to learn what will actually make them tick. And then I haven't give it to thought them. of that. Yeah. But yeah, I thought of that really... a little bit, I guess you could say in the sense of like, you need to create a good a work environment where people are happy. I mean, yeah, but that's, that's a complicated system, especially if you're like, I've run teams of 20 plus people in a remote environment. And really? so if, you, if you have 20 people working for you, all of who are unique humans who have different goals, different career trajectories, I've hired for the same role, a 21 year old college graduate 
and a 60 year old retired copywriter, same role, two different humans. Right. And so I have to manage them completely separately because the, the huh. older gentleman had a very specific worldview and set of working experiences that he's pulling from, or he was pulling from that I needed to be able to speak. And then so that he could hear me and then we could work together effectively. 21 year old recent college grad, completely different set of expectations yeah, different yeah. in life. So that's where this empathy component stands in. So you have to really understand where they're coming from and then build out a legitimate operation system based on it, right? And that that's a really complicated and actually highly technical topic because there are different tools that you would use like Asana, Trello, other, other actual management technologies that you can use to build out operational systems. I don't actually want to go into that because it's a little too technical, but but there, but you you have to have enough knowledge as a people manager to know what goes to, into those systems, right? Because a tool is only as good as the person that's using it, right? So you can have a really powerful tool, but if you don't know the inputs to put into that tool to make everyone actually work effectively, people are going to have a hard time. So that's one really important aspect of it. And mm -hmm. then the other important aspect is how you, is how a, as, as a people manager, your work ties into the entire business, right? So if you're the CEO, you a lot of the times actually need to hire someone to be a boss of yours for a specific thing. Right. So I've known well, like CEOs. Harder, I guess you think, right? I, 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 more of a boss, right? Really? Like, like, yeah. Like someone who literally is in charge of their schedule and the CEO is not like they have, they have some veto power, but in general, they're, they're not in charge of their schedule. They hire someone who gets absolute say over their schedule because that person actually has a better understanding of how to navigate the CEO's time to be more effective for the entire company because that CEO is just an absolute baller in terms of problem solving technical at work and all that jazz, but they're not as much of a baller in terms of the other things that a CEO needs to do, which is people management, marketing, um, raising, doing investor relationships and all that other jazz, right? And Fair so they need to hire someone who's an actual, who's a coach or something like that, who is their boss. It's so funny. Their, yeah, and that's, yeah, and that, the best CEOs are the ones that are humble enough to do that, where the, where they can say, I have, I, I don't know how to do this. I never did this before. I'm a, I'm an amazing product developer, but I'm not an amazing marketer. And you and you need to do a lot of publicity as a CEO of a company, especially as the company gets larger, whether that publicity be public facing or investor facing. Um, and so that's the other aspect of being a people manager is just the entire context of the the quote unquote business that you're running and how you fit into it, how you're and then how your team fits into it as well. Um, which is another really fun problem solving thing with humans. And this is why I think the this is why I think poker players have a really large ceiling when it comes to running businesses. It's because they do actually a lot of they have the logical processes down pat. Hmm. And a lot of the times they also have the the human empathy aspect of it as well, where they can kind of understand people uh, they can understand people really intuitively, especially in the context of a problem solving environment, right? Really? Like, via, well, you might have to explain that one. You, you're sitting down with like, you're sitting in Bobby's room and a dude that you've played with over the last five years, is, you're playing against him. He's in a weird mood. You know what his like, you know, he's going to be a little bit looser in these spots in this particular game, right? So like, given these emotions that this person is feeling, you can now translate that to an actual logical thought process that you can then execute on, right? Sure. Yeah. Where, so if you're a people manager and you have somebody who is going, who, who has confided in you that they're going through a really uh, difficult time mentally and emotionally, right? Like, let's say that they are hitting burnout or, or going through a divorce or whatever, right? Whatever thing is happening. You have to then t take that emotional complex and then translate it into your business and then say, wow. okay, this person, I'm not going to fire this person. I want to help this person. So I'm going to remove some of their work. I'm going to add some some of it to my plate in these ways a little bit a little bit of it to their teammate in these ways in a, in the correct increments so that the entire system doesn't break i'm going to give them more emotional resources a little more time off so my some of my time as a coach or as a as a consultant or whatever they need so that they have they they can process emotionally and then move forward and get back to their normal place, right? In the same way where it's like you play against someone who's tilted in a specific way, and then when they're not tilted anymore, you play against them differently. Um, and that's a very poker player specific tool set, right? That um, That is powerful. I think the thing that's hard hardest for poker players is the actual emotional empathy in terms of what they're really feeling and being able to just show up and like sit and hold their grief. And, well, and or, think... or, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that like, that's where I found the most uh, trouble with my poker clients is like, it, it's the actual being a like good 
human manager? Because that, that's a skill set yeah. that you don't use in poker. Well, I think a lot of the poker players, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, would um, would fail, not all of them, but would fail in the sense of like not understanding. Yeah, I mean, understanding how to deal with people, but also understanding that dealing with people does not mean being logical all the time. You can't just force logic on someone a lot of the time. Uh, I mean, there's some situations where you should, but... I mean, they're far between the ones that you shouldn't. I mean, there's, there's many more that you shouldn't than versus the ones that you should. So there's that. And I think a lot of poker players will not be able to, you know, especially in business, uh, in the real world, you know, people have all sorts of different views and places where they come from in life that are very different mm -hmm. from whoever you mm -hmm. see at the poker table. Yep. Uh, I mean, poker players struggle to even like t treat the businessman kind of okay or like struggle yeah. with the idea of like not being boring as shit at the poker table to be honest uh like yeah. it's kind of a similar principle i can so that's why i said they have a high ceiling that doesn't mean that they're all going to be good at it off the bat it means that they are going to have a lot of potential like that right. that's what i'm describing here it's like given the given their skills that they have learned in poker it really unlocks a lot of things but there are you're right specifically and what you're saying, which is the EQ, the emotional intelligence of being able to sit down with somebody and hear them from a different perspective, that is by far where the most learning needs to be done um, from what I've seen in my poker clients. But there are, like, I know of a couple very, very, very successful ex-poker players who have been able to translate really well into business. For example, like the Doug Polfs and the Ryan Keys of the world, right? Where they just did a really good job of taking their poker skill set they were really good. Like Doug specifically is just an absolute badass in terms of his work ethic and the systems that he builds for his work. And he was able to take that from what he did in poker, apply it to business and yeah. be very, very successful in that. The funny thing about him is that he struggled for a long time to be a good poker player. Uh, yeah. It's like he paid his dues early and now he's like mm -hmm. really killing it. Uh, they just like happened yep. to fit really well for business and he just started crushing. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, I was pretty impressed. I'm like, for me, it's... I feel like it's been a bit the opposite. I, I, I didn't struggle nearly as hard in business uh, or in poker, excuse me. In business, it's been like pretty slow, but uh, there's been multiple problems going on. Um, figuring out ways to fix. Uh, well, let me ask you this. What about uh, mapping out the inefficiencies? Like this seems like part of the inefficiencies would be in relationship management because in my view, this is why I think is that if there's some kind of relationship discord, it's going to manifest in all sorts of annoying ways. And what you want, really want to do is correct the relationship, and then then things will tend to move out smoothly. Yeah, that is a can of worms question because that's actually at some large companies. That's literally they have multiple teams of people that are designed for finding systemic inefficiencies at their company. It is a massive, massive, massive uh, problem set because uh, there's a bunch of because there's. There's inefficiencies from the perspective of what you described, which is like interpersonal inefficiencies. Um, yes. Are managers actually being good people managers? Are, are their direct reports actually higher, managing up effectively? Do they have good methods of communication? Do the teams share a, sh like, do the teams have a shared vocabulary for how to talk to each other? Um, there's so much that goes into that. And there are actual quantifiable metrics that you can create within, uh, within communication systems like Slack or whatever that will pull data and show you if people are communicating discordantly or not discordantly. Um, and, but then you also have to have the human aspect of that where it's like, do you have an effective mechanism for people being able to communicate up to their managers? So a lot of this is training, like training employees to be able to manage up and be like, hey, this actually doesn't feel good to me, to their managers. Training managers to be able to manage up and down, like to their people above them and to their direct reports. That's an entire problem set. Then there's another problem set, which is actually finding inefficiencies in a business. And that that is literally um, what my entire career was before poker. It was business intelligence analytics, where you build massive data infrastructure systems to wow. and then pull from those systems to actually figure out, for example, why are my why are my um, clients churning? Why are people leaving my company? That's a or leaving my business. That's a, one of the most standard and hardest things to solve. I, I huh. literally did a four month long analysis. I'm that a, was my main piece of work for that. Well, holy shit, this sounds really, really complicated. Uh, I'm curious, but I'm also uh, a little bit uh, kind of intimidated, but a little bit uh, 
Yeah, uh, I guess I don't need to learn all that yet. Uh, but <laughs> yet. start with my four-person team Jungle, well, on my podcast. What well, 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 we're focusing, yeah. <laughs> no, it's part, no, this is no. Your podcast is it's the perfect toy game, right? It's perfect, right? Yeah. We're gonna teach what's, you how to. We're gonna, teach you, we're gonna teach you how to hire. We're gonna teach you how to manage a small product. We're gonna teach you how to manage a small team, and then That's... teach you how to manage yourself in that context. All right. So all right. Showing up, showing up on time, all that stuff. Like this is it's the perfect toy problem for you to grow inside of. All right. Yeah, that turns out that way. Maybe it, the key to actually winning the game of life somehow. Um, I think I think you're dialing into it, dude. Like just okay. just the the revelation you had yesterday and today about like wait, this podcast is literally my mechanism for learning and growing. And so the thing that I'm telling, like the name of my podcast, is literally what I'm trying to do with this podcast, right? I'm like, wait, these so, people. I want to hire it, the people on my podcast. <laughs> All right. You call it serendipity. I call it intuition. I think that this is something that you did for yourself, even though you didn't know why you were doing it. And that's one of your biggest skills. It's it's having that that intuition into doing, to, to creating situations for yourself that actually end up being incredibly beneficial. And that's something that you've earned and have grown over your entire career. Thank you. I think, uh, thank me. I, I don't know. Uh, thank, thank everyone. We all deserve all right, the gratitude. Thank everyone. Right thank all right. thank me. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. Um, all right. So, I have a question uh, for hiring decisions. Now, I think we went into this a little bit, but what are you looking for for hiring decisions? And is there a parallel to poker to like hiring stake people you want to stake? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, we have five minutes left before my cutoff, so I'm just gonna yeah. I'm gonna try to do the short and concise. Yeah, five minutes for this question. This is I... perfect. Easy game. Um, the first, literally, the number it, it is similar in terms of people that I want to work with in poker and people I want to work with in business. Same thing that I talked about right now. Do they actually have the technical skills that I'm looking for, right? So if I'm looking to stake someone in poker, can they actually play poker well, right? Well, if they can, they're probably not going to be looking for a stake most of the time. Well, it depends on it depends on what they're looking for. They can maybe play it decently, but aren't crushers, right? They, and they want a coach and a system that can help yeah. them build up, right? Mm -hmm. Do they have good time management? Are they good communicators, right? Um, the, all of these things that I look for in the business world, I also would look for in, in terms of hiring someone in poker. I don't do a lot of staking, particularly because of what you just described. There's not a lot of good candidates. And so I'm not gonna try to run a business where my entire hiring pool is not good candidates, which is why I don't do staking, um, generally speaking. Not to say that you can't run a profitable staking business. I know dudes like Pads have done it for a while and are very successful with it, uh, but it's not, or like Poker Detox also. It's like, it's not my, not my jam. Um, but what I'm really, really looking for is people that are good humans. That's my number one thing. I, I hire specifically good humans. And that's my definition of a good human, right? And so that's subjective. But it's somebody that I want to spend time around who I feel as if will I have the ability to make their life better. They have the ability to make my life better. That is sure. my number one thing for hiring. Because you spend a lot of time with the person. You talk about them a lot. And I'm in a fortunate situation where... I don't have a lot of, like, I'm not finding scarcity in these roles. Like sometimes if you're in a thousand person company, you have to be a little less picky, but I get to be very picky. And so I hire people that I really enjoy working with and that's step one. And then I, and then step two is, do they have the technical skill set for me to work with? Cause I would actually even rather hire someone who's a little less technical and then hire a consultant to train them on something and then give them that gift, like pay for a consultant to teach them something. So that I don't have to work with the like work with this consultant. I just like hire them for some amount of time. They teach this person, and then I get to get to work with the person who I like working. Well, with. yeah, you have to that find is, ways of minimizing time and delegating time, of course. Yeah, yeah. But, but what I'm more what I'm more saying is I would I'll pay money and lose a little bit of time actually. Like instead of hiring someone who's more technically strong, I'll hire someone who's less technically strong but who I like more, and then take more time to train them up because in the long run I will it, it everything will work better. They're less likely to churn. They're more likely to have work satisfaction. I'm more likely to have work satisfaction. And in the long run, my business is going to run more efficiently. I am not of the mindset of like hire, hyperscale, and then like burn yourself out. I am of the mindset of hire, grow consistently, but not over forcing everybody. And then do that repeatedly over like a decade. That's my perspective on running business. Uh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the long and slow route versus the hyper the quote unquote fast route. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm in between. Route. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a little bit of both. I'm not like the, I'm not like the full tortoise, but I'm not the full hair. I'd say that I'm like 
forty percent hare, sixty percent tortoise in, in terms of my back and forth. Well, yeah, sure. The the tortoise is an exaggeration anyway. I mean, you want to like yeah. push yourself. Like the tortoise is always comfortable, right? Like the tortoise is like chilling. You want to like yeah. be a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, a lot of people like that. A, a lot of people aren't comfortable in discomfort, though, right? Like they they don't know how to sit inside of discomfort, and so they will lose a lot of EV because they don't want to put themselves in a not fun situation or in a an uncomfortable situation. And so that's another skill of poker players. We're really good at sitting inside of discomfort, right? I play PLO for a living, or I did for a long time, right? Like I I know what it's like to lose for months and months on end and you just have to you have to be able to do that sometimes in business yeah well that's a good thing to finish off that uh yeah we're out of time but yeah it's been great having you on the podcast and picking your brain on how to teach people and uh run businesses and jump uh, in between poker business and uh uh discover as well yeah totally is there anything you'd like to promote or uh any Not really, like I, what I do want to say is I know there's a lot of poker players right now, uh, especially post WSOP that are maybe feeling a little burnt out on poker. So if you want to have a conversation about how to transition out of poker, um, DylanWeissman.com slash contact, hit me up. I'm, I'm really, I have a, I have multiple clients right now from that are poker players who are trying to either find a new way to live inside of poker or transition out of poker. And I really enjoy working with those clients because yep. it takes a lot of empathy to know the specific problems you're facing. And that's something that I think that I do a good job of. All right, cool. Yep. All right. Thank you for your time, Dylan. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you. This is a lot of fun.